sure to download the free patterns by clicking the link in the description. Every single day this week, a new instructor is going to stream live as we sew, quilt, knit, and decorate cookies. You'll get a step-by-step -step demonstration and full of summer projects from each of our instructors. Of course, if you have any questions during the event, please leave your comments in the blue chat box below or in the chat on Facebook and YouTube. I will be monitoring those comments and questions during the entire event. You can even just drop in a hello and where you're watching from if you would like to get things started. Uh, now for our special, um, before I bring on our special instructor today, just a heads up for the questions that you have, I do try to get them to our instructor if they are on the step of the project that we're working on, but anything that's more general, don't be afraid to put a general question in there as well. When we have time at the end of the session, I like to get as many of those asked as possible as well. So questions, comments, get that chat box rolling. And then before we get digging into today's project, I need to introduce today's instructor. So I'm going to bring on Kelly Ashton. She joins us today. She's our quilting expert and an instructor for both Craftsy and the National Quilter Circle. Hello and welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much for being here. I'd love for you to start telling us a little bit about yourself and the project that we're making with you today. Well, hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. I couldn't be more thrilled to be like kicking off this summer crafting party. And so I would be happy to tell you a little bit about uh, myself. You are joining me in a part of my studio in the greater Kansas City metro area. So welcome to middle America for wherever you are. And um, I've been making quilts, oh my gosh, for a really long time, like probably awfully close to 40 years. That's, that's a really long time when I say that number out loud. And I've been teaching for more than 30 and I love making quilts. I love playing with fabric and color. And so I'm just excited to have you here with me today and that we can do some of this playing together. And I am excited about the projects that we're going to be doing today. Um, as you can see, I have two of my table runners here on my design wall. The top one is called Sparkler and the one below it is called Spinner. And that's just because of the two different blocks that we are going to be working with. But that's not the end of it because I'm actually gonna show you two other blocks that you can make today from the pieces and parts that we're going to be working with. So by the time we're finished with this today, you are gonna have so many options to make this little table runner. And then the finishing is just the same for every single one. Um, just three blocks, putting on your inner and outer border quilting it and binding it. So it's a fast project. It's one um, you know, that I made red, white, and blue since here in the States, we're getting ready to celebrate our Independence Day on July 4th. But I know there may be many of you that are in other places around the world and you might like red, white, and blue, but you also might choose other color combinations for your uh, table runners. And whatever you decide to work with, it's gonna be great. It's just a fun, easy project, quick to do, and you just be amazed how quickly we get through it. So, so glad you're here. All right, Kelly, thanks for that brief intro. So for anybody that's just joining us, Kelly is now going to get started with today's project. Uh, if you have questions about the project, go right into that chat box. We'll get to them as we can. Kelly's gonna let us know when we have little brief pauses between steps, we'll get some questions in there and then I'll save any more general questions until the end of this session. So with that said, we've got people viewing from all over the United States. I saw as far away as Juno so far. So I wow. have a bunch of people watching and ready to go, Kelly. So I'm going to send it right to you to get started with step number one. Great. I'm just thrilled. Well, step number one really is I hope that you have all um, taken the time to download your pattern for today. And this is a complete pattern from start to finish. I won't be putting on the borders today. Basically, we're going to talk about um, some cutting things and block construction and ways that you can create different blocks from the basic unit that we're going to make. But your instructions are complete and it takes you start to finish from a supply list all the way through to getting the top piece together and then encouraging you to go ahead and quilt it and get it bound so that you can use it. So if you haven't downloaded your pattern, you will definitely want to do that um, because it's got all the information in it. And then I'm just going to spend some time with you today going through some of the nitty gritty. So as I mentioned before, these are the two um, 
table runners that I have completed for this, but there's really a possibility of four different blocks. And we're gonna talk about all of that. And I'm gonna show you how, how to work through and put together those blocks today. And so as much as I love standing here and waving at you and being able to smile, a lot of today is gonna to be spent with you looking at my hands because we're going to move over to my work table where you're gonna get a close up and I can show you literally step-by-step step how to move through this process. And we'll also be talking about some specifics from some of the supplies on the supply list. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on over to the table and I will meet you there. All right, I can already see this as a fantastic view. Excited to get started. Excellent, well here, here we are. And I'm just gonna put this little unit down here first because this is the base unit that is the fundamental part of all the blocks that we're gonna be looking at today. And so I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step step how you are going to construct this little unit. And then from that point, you just make units and put them together into blocks and you're gonna have a variety of blocks to choose from. So I think that's really cool when we can start out and, and literally have just one unit and, um, have so many options for the things that we can do with it. So I'm gonna set the unit aside. And the first thing that I'm gonna do is open up the instructions to the page with, um, there's page one and it's got the two table runners that I showed you up on the wall and your basic fabric requirements. And I imagine that you've probably already looked through those. On the next page, we have a list of other supplies. And there are a few things on there that I just want to point out to you and talk you through. And at the bottom, you'll see I had some instructions for fabric preparation. So I think the sewing machine, the thread and the sewing machine needles are pretty self-explanatory. And of course, any other notions that you like to work with. You will want to have some sort of fabric marking utensil. And so what I have here are two uh, mechanical pencils. This one is literally the same kind of mechanical pencil that I would pull out of my office to write on paper. So it's the old quote lead pencil um, that we use to write with, but it's what I go to a whole lot of the time to mark lightly, light colored fabrics. Um, and I think they work just great. If you're working with a dark fabric, I really like the white chalk pencils. This one happens to be a Bowen brand, B-O-H-I-N, but I, um, Soline has a great one, Fonz and Porter has a great one. They're all different kinds that you can get, but you can see it's just got the little white chalk lead. And so it's really easy to mark dark fabrics and then it's also really easy to wipe away those marks. So those are really my two predominant go-to marking pencils when I am marking fabric because they show up between the two of them they show up on just about every fabric. Now today you'll see when I get to the point where we mark I'm just going to use a regular ballpoint pen and that's not because that's what I typically do on my fabric but it's so that you'll be able to see the line that I'm going to put on the fabric. So I'll be using that today to show you but it's these mechanical pencils that I typically use to mark my fabric. Of course, we always have our rotary cutters and mats and rulers. And I have to tell you that unless I just have to cut a lot of fabric, my go-to size for my rotary cutter is the little 28 millimeter where the blade is about the size of a quarter. And I use this a lot. And part of the reason is because I actually oftentimes am cutting around acrylic templates. Now I'm not for this project, we're just using some of our basic rulers, but I really like the size because I feel like I have a lot of control when I use this size rotary cutter. And because my fingers are typically fairly close in proximity to the blade, it's a, it's a much smaller blade. So between the extra control and the smaller blade, I feel like I'm safer and I'm gonna get the most accurate cut that I possibly can. So the 28 millimeter is my favorite go-to size for rotary cutting, unless I've just got tons and tons and tons of cutting that has to be done. Um, of course, 
Also on the list was an iron and an ironing surface, but I want to show you a little tool that you're going to actually see me use today. I'm not even setting up an iron because I have discovered this wonderful little roller tool and it has become one of my favorite new tools and I'll be showing you periodically today um, how it works, but this one happens to be um, by Violet Craft. It's a wooden handle, a wooden roller with a nice heavy metal attachment. Um, so it's pretty heavy in the hand, but it works really well for pressing seams. So it's kind of like finger pressing on steroids. And this has become a really wonderful go-to tool for me. I keep it by my sewing machine so that when I'm making smaller units like the one that we're working on today, and maybe I'll chain piece certain segments and then I really um, don't wanna have to get up and walk across the room to the ironing board before I continue. I can use this little tool and get a nice, pretty darn crisp press of that seam, which allows me to continue my work without having to get up. And then I can go iron the entire unit later on. So this has become um, just a wonderful little tool and I did put it as an optional tool on your supply list, but after you see me um, with it today, you might decide you need one for your sewing room as well. Um, another um, <clears throat> tool that is on the supply list as an optional tool is uh, the Marty Michelle Deluxe Corner Trimmer. And I'm gonna hold up a picture to show you what that looks like. This is what the Deluxe Corner Trimmer looks like. It's called Deluxe because it has so many of the angles that we typically use throughout our quilt making. Now I have to tell you, I went to look for my deluxe corner trimmer today and it has gone missing. So I have um, the original corner trimmer from Marty Michelle that I'll be using today that has the 90 degree angle and the 45 degree angles, which are really the only two angles that we're dealing with today. So this one's gonna work just fine, but I really enjoy having, and I sure hope I can find my deluxe corner trimmer because it covers a lot of angles, 90, 45, um, 120, like in hexagons, 60 degree, like in 60 degree diamonds. There's just a variety of really helpful angles on there for trimming. And I'll show you how that's gonna work here in a little while. Another thing that's on my supply list is Mary Ellen's Best Press or some other type of fabric sizing. And I talked to you in the supply list about how to do fabric preparation. And because in our cutting today, we are going to be cutting pieces that have bias edges, I really like to prepare my fabric ahead of time. And basically, just like I described in the instructions, I take my fabric that I'm gonna be using to my ironing station or my pressing station, and I generously spritz it with Mary Ellen's Best Press. And then I use a hot iron on cotton setting with no steam. I press it from both sides after I have spritzed it. And when I say spritz it, I'm really generous. I'm not making it drippy wet, but I am getting the fibers dampened. And so I dampen those fibers, then I press it with that hot dry iron on both sides of the fabric. And then I either hang it on my design wall or I set it over the back of a chair or whatever and just let it dry completely. Then take it back to my pressing station and make sure that I've got all of the little gentle wrinkles out. But that really helps add some extra stability to your fabric before we start cutting these pieces um, that are going to have bias edges. Now I'll tell you um, kind of my true confession for the day. I used to be just diligent about pre-washing all of my fabric and the busier I got and the better the, the fabric dyeing became from the manufacturers, the less likely it was that I pre-washed my fabric. Now I'm not trying to talk you into doing it one way or the other because I think we all have to do our own due diligence and do whatever we think is best. However, I will say if you do pre-wash your fabric before cutting, adding this step becomes extra important because if you have pre-washed your fabric, you've now washed away all of the sizing that came in the fabric from the manufacturer. And so you want to put some of that sizing back in to help 
add that stability to your fabric so that when we start working with those bias edges, it's way less likely that we're going to distort our patchwork pieces. So that little step is in there with complete instructions and I have found it to be very, very helpful with my fabric when I'm working with bias edges and I hope that you will find it helpful as well. And of course, at the bottom, I have the klutz glove as optional. And you will see that today I am not going to be wearing a klutz glove. However, um, they really can be finger savers. So if you have a tendency toward klutziness, a klutz glove is always a good idea. Now, I put some pre-workshop cutting instructions in your handouts. And hopefully you've had some time to do that. But what I'm going to do is show you the cut pieces like I asked you to cut. And these are the pieces for one complete block. Now each complete block uses four of these little units. So what I'm about to show you will make four units. So we're gonna have four of these little two and a, cut two and a half inch squares. I'll set one there so you can see it very clearly. We're gonna have two squares and this out of, I used the red fabric for this position, this position in the unit. We've got two squares that are cut four and seven eighths inches. And then we've got one square each from my cream fabric and from my blue fabric. And those are five and one fourth inches cut size. Now, I'm gonna show you the step that we need to do next to create the pieces that we need to make our four units. The two and a half inch squares are, are all cut and ready to go. So I'm just gonna set those aside. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we're going to cut our squares, either quarter square triangles or half square triangles. So let me just tell you for a second what exactly what I mean by that. So here is a unit that I have made before I added my extra little triangle down here. So this is the way that we're gonna finish the unit, but right now here is the same unit, but I don't have that little cream colored triangle. So when we look at this square, this square is made up of, of triangle shapes, three different triangles, and the difference in the triangles are this triangle is a half square triangle because as you can see, that triangle makes up one half of the square. And these two triangles are quarter square triangles because each one makes up one fourth or one quarter of the entire square. And so when there are so many tools available like triangles on a roll, thangles, lots of products out there to help you make quarter square and half square triangles. But for a combined block like this that I call a half and half block because it's half quarter square triangles and and half half square triangles, I like to do it the old fashioned way, which is starting out with those squares that I had you cut from the instructions. So I've got my two five and a quarter inch squares here, and I've got my two four and seven eighths inch squares here. And let me show you what we're gonna do with those. And I'm gonna start with my two four and seven eighths inch squares. Now I'm gonna cut these individually. If you were really careful, you could stack them one on top of the other and just be careful to make sure all of your edges are lined up and you really could cut them all at once. But I'm going to go ahead and cut them individually just so that I get to show you twice how to cut half square triangle from this square. So all I'm going to do is take one of my rulers and I'm going to carefully line it up over the square right from corner to corner. And when I do that, I'm gonna hold my ruler in place and I'm gonna cut that square in half. Just wanna make sure I'm right where I wanna be. There we go. I'm gonna cut that square in half. And now I have taken my square and it is now divided into two half square triangles because each of those triangles is a half of a square. So you notice that we cut this at four and seven eighths inches. And so here's the rule of thumb. Our unit finished size is four inches. So if I were to measure this right now, it would measure four and a half inches unfinished, 
four inches finished. So the rule of thumb for cutting squares to make half square triangles is you take the finished size of your square, which in our case is four inches, add seven eighths of an inch, and that's the size square that you need to cut to get your half square triangles. So that's why this square started at four and seven eighths inches. The reason is that when we cut that diagonal, we're gonna lose more in um, when we piece it, even though we're still gonna use our scant quarter inch seam allowance because of the diagonal rather than a perpendicular cut, we lose more of the, the volume of the block that we started with. So that's why instead of cutting this square four and a half inches, we had to cut it four and seven eighths inches. So there's our first two half square triangles. And I'm just gonna repeat that with my other four and seven eighths inch square, lining my ruler up very carefully from corner to corner, and then cut it in half once again. And so now I have four half square triangles, one for each of my units that will make up my block. Now we're gonna move on to the two squares that we're going to cut to make quarter square triangles. So you know that these we started out with, they are a cut size of five and one fourth inches. And that's because in order to get our quarter square triangle, like we see here, we're gonna cut this in half on the diagonal in both directions. And so instead of having one diagonal seam that we have to add a little bit of extra to in order for it to all come together properly, we now have to add even more. So the rule of thumb when you're doing quarter cutting squares to make quarter square triangles is finished size of the block, which again in our case is four inches, add one and one fourth inches, which is why we cut this square at five and a fourth inches. So now I'm going to take my ruler and I'm gonna cut this in half on the diagonal in both directions. So I'm gonna carefully place my ruler and do my first diagonal cut. And then I'm gonna carefully lift up my ruler so that I don't move my triangles. And I'm gonna lay it down in the opposite direction from corner to cut corner going the other way. And now I'm gonna make my second cut. So I have just taken that square and created four quarter square triangles. So I'm gonna do that once more now with my blue square. So there are our pieces, our light colored quarter square triangles. And now I'm going to do the same thing with my five and one fourth inch blue square. And I'm gonna cut it in half on the diagonal in both directions. So there's the first, carefully move my ruler, line it up with those opposite corners, cut, and there we are. And now we have our blue square cut into four quarter square triangles. Now, this is where um, your corner cutter comes in if you want to use it. So the corner cutter, it doesn't matter that the template is smaller than the triangle because all we're concerned about is lining up this corner with the 45 degree corner of our triangle. So you'll notice now that we cut that square into four triangles, this angle is a 90 degree angle and the two outside angles are 45 degree angles. And you'll notice also that on the quarter square triangles, our straight of grain is now on these outside edges, but on our half square triangles, even though the shape of the triangle is the same, it's larger of course, but here's our 90 degree angle, here's our two 45 degree angles on each triangle, and both of these edges are on grain, and here's our bias edge for our half square triangles. For our quarter square triangle, this is the edge that's on grain and both of these edges are bias. So that becomes kind of the clue as to why we care whether we're including quarter square or half square triangles because when we finish piecing our block, 
we really want to have straight of grain all the way around our unit. That just adds stability to our patchwork when we make sure as much as possible that we have straight of grain along the outside edges of our units and of our, our quilt blocks. So here's that quarter square triangle with the straight of grain along the outside. Here's our other quarter square triangle with the straight of grain on the outside. And then here's our half square triangle with straight of grain also on both, both of these outside edges. So that's why we went to the trouble of cutting those the way that we did. Okay, so I'll just pause here for a moment and say, anybody have any questions about that so far? Uh, there aren't any questions. If you have them, go ahead and drop them right now. But there is a reminder, we had a viewer, Gina, ask a question that is a really common one. So I'd like to give everybody this reminder. Yes, you can come back and watch this anytime later. So if you're joining us in the middle of today's project and you didn't catch the beginning, don't worry. Or if you're going back to do your project, not sewing along with the project, you're doing it at a later time, you can always come back and view this on the site so you can catch those little tidbits, anything that you want to go back to and see again, it's going to be available for you. Excellent. Thank you so much for that reminder. Of course. And I haven't seen any questions pop in just yet, Kelly, so you could go right into the next step. Okay. So I want to show you how this corner trimmer works. And like I said, this is the original corner trimmer. This is the 90 degree angle. And both of these are 45 degree angles, which are exactly the angles we're working with today. So it doesn't matter whether this is bigger than the triangle we've cut or smaller than the triangle we've cut, because all we're concerned with is lining this up in the corner that we want to trim. And so for all of these pieces, the only corners that we really want to trim are the 45 degree corners. We don't need to worry about trimming the 90 degree corners on any of the pieces. So um, this comes with a paper backing on it. And I opted to leave the paper backing on because it just helps as an anti-skid um, property on the back of the, of the template. But you could remove it and then put some other kind of anti-skid on the back if you wanted to. So I'm just gonna take my little corner trimmer and carefully line it up so that these two edges slide right in and line up with the two edges of my triangle. And then I'm just gonna trim off that corner. And then I'm gonna turn it over and do the other 45 degree angle here where you can see it again, just sliding my template on so that the edges are lined up with the both of the side edges of my patchwork and cut that off. Now, do you have to do this? No, but what I will say is that by doing this, it's amazing how much bulk you get rid of by just trimming off those corners before you even piece anything. And it also can be helpful in getting your patchwork pieces lined up. So I'm gonna trim, one of each of these just so that you I can show you how beautifully the pieces line up at the corners when you trim off that excess because all of that that we just trimmed off would be in the seam allowance if I left it and it just adds a lot more bulk to the places where the pieces come together than really needs to be there so it takes an extra you know few seconds for each piece to do this, but it really can help um, with the lining up of your pieces and with getting bulk out of the way from your block. So there are my two quarter square triangles and now I can do the same thing with the half square triangle. Again, I'm not gonna trim the 90 degree angle um, because there's really no reason to, but trimming the bulk away from those 45 degree angles is really helpful. So once again, I'm lining it up so that the edges of my template are just right up against the edges of my sides that lead into that corner. And we're just taking off the tips of that triangle. So that's all there is to it. So there's the corner trimmer. So let me show you with these little quarter square triangles, just how nice it is when you have your pieces clipped. So I'm gonna put them in the orientation that they're going to be in the block, which is like this. 
And so this will be the seam that's gonna join those two quarter square triangles. So when I flip this over and put right sides together, I'm gonna lift it up so you can see how nicely that corner, those corners line up and come together. And then this would be the edge that I would be sewing. So I'm just gonna lay it out one more time so that you can see, there we are. I would put it right sides together and sew this seam with my scant quarter inch seam allowance. So that's basically the first steps in getting us started. We've got all of our squares cut down into our half square triangles and our quarter square triangles. And now I'm ready to show you what the next step is. So let me move this out of the way and bring the next pieces over. So here, Basically, I'm gonna show you one more time exactly what I just had out so that you can see. There are my two quarter square triangles without having trimmed the, the tips of these. And then we're gonna set our little square off to the side because we're gonna do that in a few minutes. So here's the next step is we're gonna sew those quarter square triangles together just like I talked you through a moment ago. So the first step of any sewing is to put our two quarter square triangle pieces together. And just like I did, I always lay out my pieces in the orientation that I want them. So let me just bring those pieces back out just so that you can see. Because if I lay them out the way that I know that I want them, I'm much less likely to stitch something in a place that I don't want it. So I always lay my pieces out exactly the way I want them and then start by putting the first two pieces together and that's what I've done here. So you can see that I've seamed together with my scant quarter inch seam allowance, my two quarter square triangles, and I'm gonna turn it over and the seam is pressed toward the darker fabric. So let me just show you what, how I would use my little roller if I were sitting by my machine and had just stitched this. I would have taken it off, clipped my threads, and then I would open this up in the direction that I want my seam to go because I want my seam to go toward the dark. And then I'm just gonna use my fingers to try to get it nice and crisp and then just run my roller right over that seam. And it just lays beautifully flat. So it's really, really helpful because none of these pieces did I take to the iron. I did do the roller over at once when, as soon as I finished piecing it but just in exactly the way that I showed you just now. And you can see that it does lay nice and flat and then immediately lets me go on and continue sewing. So I just love that about it. So that's step one. Step two is we're going to attach our square to the 90 degree corner of our half square triangle. So I'm gonna move these pieces out of the way. I'm gonna leave this here so you can see it. And now is when we're going to actually mark that square. So let me move this up out of the way a little bit and show you. This is what I'm gonna want it to look like. I'm gonna want a line marked on my square from corner to opposite corner. And that is my stitching line because we're gonna do what we call a folded corner square on this half square triangle. So here's my little square and I'm gonna get my straight edge and as I said, normally I would use um, my lead pencil that I would write with at my desk because that'll show up on this light fabric. If I had a dark fabric, I would use my white chalk pencil, but so that you can see the line, I'm just gonna use a ballpoint pen so that you can actually see what I'm doing. So I'm lining up my ruler across the diagonal from corner to corner, and I'm just, a tiny bit to the left of my, where my straight line needs to go. Because if I put my ruler exactly on the points, my line is gonna be offset just a little bit. So I kind of gauge to see how far to move my ruler over. And I think I've got it in a pretty good spot to get my line pretty much right down the center of my square. So there I have marked, that worked out pretty well. 
I marked my line from corner to corner so that I have a diagonal sewing line on my square and I'm going to lay it right sides together on my on the 90 degree corner of my half square triangle with the line parallel to my bias edge of my half square triangle. So we're gonna stitch along that line. And if you um, feel comfortable in the, to put a pin or two in, please pin it to whatever level it makes you comfortable so that you feel like your pieces aren't gonna move. And so here is my triangle now with my square stitched on. So I'll bring it closer. You can see that it is stitched and ready to go. So before I attach these two pieces, I can even use my roller. I'm gonna flip my square over so that I have, there's my folded corner triangle now. And I'm just gonna go ahead and use my little roller and see how nicely that lays nice and flat. And before I even attach it, I'm gonna carefully move only the top layer back. So I've got everything right sides up. I'm gonna move my top layer back. I'm gonna take my ruler and I'm gonna trim this to a quarter inch. And that gives me then my quarter inch seam allowance. So we're just gonna trim those little triangles out of the way and they are now trash. Or some people like to save these and use them for um, leaders and enders or some people make little, um, very tiny half square triangle squares out of these little corners. So whatever you like to do with those, but we won't need it for this project. So there I've trimmed to my quarter inch seam allowance. And now I'm just gonna go over my seam one more time with my roller so it lays nice and flat. And there are the two big chunks of my unit. And now we're gonna put those right sides together and stitch them. So this would be the time where, since I, I do have clipped corners here, I would go ahead and clip the corners there just to make it easy to line up. But the other way you can line it up is just to line up your opposite 90 degree angles here. And then you pretty much know that it's, it's gonna be right exactly where you want it to be. So right sides together, you can put a pin in if you, wish, and then we're gonna sew that seam. And by doing that, when we open it up, we end up with our unit. And that is the primary unit for everything that we are, are doing today. So you can see how quick and easy it is because once you start and have your pieces cut, you can chain piece your two quarter square triangles together. So you can just, if, if you're gonna make a three block table runner like what we show in the instructions, you can just have all of your pairs there and you can just zip through and stitch all 12 of these segments together to start with. And then you can mark your um, all 12 of your squares and you can chain piece all of those squares onto the corner of your half square triangle. And then you'll be able to chain piece your two half square triangle segments together to get your unit. So the piecing really goes quite quickly. And I think you'll be surprised at how fast these table runners come together. So now that um, I'm gonna stop for just a moment and see if you have any questions about the construction of this unit. Perfect, there are a few questions. Um, actually, first, it's an equipment question. I'm wondering if you could answer it and then also just lay these into the screen for us to see after you answer it. So sure. what rotary cutter and ruler are you using? Ah, I am using uh, an Olfa 28 millimeter rotary cutter. So the 28 millimeter is the blade that's about the size of a quarter. And the ruler that I happen to be using here is just, uh, it's a creative grids ruler. It's a 12 and a half by a uh, three and a half inch ruler. But any, I, I just like it because it's such a nice size, especially when I'm working with small units. I just find this to be a really lovely size to work with. But I also, um, I had a square ruler on your supply list. And the one that I have here with me today is, is an Omnigrid. It's a six and a half inch ruler. And the reason that I put that on your supply list was so that for when you were cutting your squares from your strips. So for example, here's my two and a half inch strip 
And from that, I would be cutting my two and a half inch squares. And so I really like using a square ruler for cutting squares. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just line up my, any, any straight line on my ruler with the edge of my strips. And I'm going to trim off the salvage so that I don't have that in my way. And then I find it really easy to use my square ruler to cut squares because I just find my two and a half inch line and line it up with the bottom edge of my strip and have the edge of my ruler at the top. And there's my two and a half inch mark. And I can just move right across the strip and easily, easily, easily cut my two and a half inch squares or any size square up to six and a half inches. Because like I said, the other um, two squares are either five and a quarter inches or four and seven eighths inches. And this ruler would work beautifully for cutting any of those sizes. So I always like keeping a couple of different sizes of square rulers handy. I usually keep a couple of sizes of rectangular rulers handy. And like I said, this three and a half by 12 and a half I love, but I also usually keep uh, an eight and a half by 12 and a half ruler close by that I, I find to be a very handy size. So um, those are just some of my real go-to tools when I'm working just in general on just about any project. All right, and our next question of the two, um, is there any advantage to piecing the quarter squares together piece by piece? rather than using the fast piece method, i.e. squares overlaid, stitching along diagonal lines? Um, is there any advantage? So are you talking about when we added the, the folded corner, the little square? Um, the question came in before you got to that step. So I'm not okay. sure if you wanna drop that into the chat box, if you're still watching out there, uh, any clarification, I'll keep an eye out for it. But I think it's in general. Okay, in general, um, you know, sometimes, especially if I am making an entire square that's from four quarter square triangles, sometimes I will use triangle paper, like for example, triangles on a roll. And occasionally I have done that even for half square triangle squares. But when I'm making a combination unit like this, that's got two quarter square triangles and a half square triangle and then a folded corner, I usually just cut them um, the old fashioned way, which is um, the equations that I told you when you take your finished size and add seven eighths of an inch for your half square triangles, you take finished size and add one and a fourth inches uh, for your quarter square triangles and cut them just because I knew that I could cut exactly what I needed to make the four units per block. So I just find that easy. And, and that's kind of why I like I kind of like knowing those rules of thumb. I sort of commit those, have committed those to memory because anytime that I need a quarter square triangle or a half square triangle, I can immediately figure out what size square to start with to get what I need for my finished product project. So, um, so if there's, I don't know that I would say there's an advantage. I just think sometimes it's easier to do this, especially when you have a combination unit um, than it is to use like triangle paper and then have to tear all the paper away. But um, I think they all have their place and, they, and it's wonderful that we have so many different kinds of tools at our disposal that we can use to make different pieces and parts of our quilts. So I just, I love being able to do that. Um, clarification just came in. It is the quarter square pieces that was the specific question. So the quarter square pieces. Okay, yeah. I just I just really like adding that one and a fourth inches and then cross cutting the square like I like I demonstrated. I just find that especially in this kind of a unit to be a really quick, easy way to do it. All right. Well, that's it for the questions at the moment. We have um, about 15 minutes before we hit the next hour marker. So okay. I'm gonna let Kelly take it away with the next part of the project. So the next thing I want to do now that you know how to piece this unit, and this is the unit that you're gonna piece to make the blocks. I just wanna show you how putting four of them together, um, the, the options that we have available to us. And so the first way that I'm laying out these four units is exactly the way that you saw on the very first table runner um, in your packet. So I'm gonna to try to just go back to the cover here. So there's our, our first 
table runner. And this is the block that I made for this one. And there it is. So you can see that I just laid it out so that every one of the units is just turned 90 degrees as it goes around the square. And so when I put it together, it just made this really cool um, kind of pieced square with the colors coming off around it. And I really, really liked that. And if you'll turn to page, let me find it here, turn to page eight in your handout, there it shows it again, the beautiful um, use of that particular square in our first table runner. But just taking these same four pieces, there's so much more that can be done. So I'm gonna move these out of the way just for a second and show you that pieced block. So there's the first pieced block. And again, this is the way that I made my runner, just three complete blocks. But if you'll turn to the next page, page nine, it shows you an alternative way to piece it. And that is putting two complete blocks together and then taking half blocks and putting them at either end. So I made one half block unit so that I could just set it here and show you. And of course that would be pieced seamed together so the points would be touching, but it just lets you have a, an alternative layout even though you've made exactly the same pieces, you just, the third block, you don't put it together into a whole block, you leave it in two halves and put one at each end. And so it just gives an interesting different look to your pieces. So I just like having options and I thought that was a really fun option. Now I do want to point out for this particular block where your red sections are lining up, the way that you want to press those, and I think if I turn this over, you'll see, you want half your, your units to be pressed with the seams going outward from your red section and half the seams to be pressed with the seams going toward the red section. And that way, when you put your pieces together, you can see how they line up so that you get nice, crisp corners because your pieces are just gonna line up beautifully. So all of that information is in your handout. So just using the half block instead of three full blocks gives you another alternative. So now I wanna take those same four pieces that we just worked with and I'm gonna show you how to make the second block. So that's the block that we're looking at in the table run here. And this is on page 10. So this is the second option for the table runner. And to do that, we're simply gonna rotate these pieces. And I always have to stop and look at this to make sure that I'm getting them going the right direction. There we go. Cause I'm still keeping my blue to the outside, but I just wanna make my red, instead of going around, it's now the red is all radiating from the center. So it's just a matter of turning your pieces in a different orientation. And it gives you a, a block that looks very, very different from the first block that we played with, simply by turning it around a little bit. So that's the second block and I have one pieced together here so that you can see it. So I'm just gonna slide these pieces over out of the way and there is the finished block. So that's the block that is in the second table runner that is featured on the cover of the pattern that you downloaded. But there are two other options for making blocks from these same pieces. One of them I did show you in your pattern, and that is this block that I called Whirligig. So again, it's the same unit, but it's just changing the orientation of where that blue triangle lands. So we're still having the red piece that extends out from the center, but the blue now is toward the inside rather than toward the outside. So there we go. So the same four units, but we're just turning them a different direction to give us a third block option. And I just called that block Whirligig. I, I just think it's really cute. So now if you wanted to, when you make all your 12 units, you could make one of each of those blocks and have a table runner that have three different blocks in it if you wanted to. 
and that would be perfectly fine. But then there is one more option available. And I just love that. So, well, first let me show you, there's, there's the pieced block of the whirly gig block. So I'll move these out of the way and there's one that I pieced together. And I just love how we've got that little, that little um, like windmill in the center and then the longer spokes extending out from the center of the block. I just think it's a block that has a lot of movement and it's really, really fun. But there is yet one more option for a block using those four pieces. And I did not put it in the handout. So if you've got your phone handy, you might wanna take a screenshot. Of course, you'll be able to watch this over again, but that's this block where we've still got the pinwheel in the center, but now we have surrounded the pinwheel with our four um, red stripes that sort of frame it. And so to, to get that, we just move this back out of the way. I'll show you, all we're doing now is turning our blue and cream colored quarter square triangles in toward the center of the block. So it's as easy as that to make this last block option. So again, this one is, there's no picture of this in your pattern, but it's just turning your pieces one, the last option that's available and you can have that block. So I just thought it was really fun how we could take a single unit that is so easy to make and so quick to make and that so much of it can be chain pieced and end up with such variety in the projects that we end up with. So let me pause there once again and see if we have any questions. We do, Kelly. Uh, first of all, a comment. Hadn't realized that both of the runners came from the same base blocks. So I think you're blowing a few minds out there with that <laughs> quick 90 degree turn. It's really fantastic. Um, and then two quick questions for you. Uh, first for sure. Debbie. Debbie is asking, should you be worried about using different rulers in the same project because they might measure a little bit differently from one another? You know, that's a really good question. And um, part of, I'll, I'm gonna give you a sort of a two part answer on that. I would say that if you ever want to be absolutely certain that there's not gonna be any um, variation to go ahead and use rulers that come from the same manufacturer. Now, having said that, I will say that Creative Grids and Omnigrid are both companies with tremendous reputations. And I have, you know, I line them up with one another. I take a look and they line up perfectly. And so these are two companies that I feel like I really trust. And there are other good companies out there too. Don't get me wrong. These are just the two that I happen to have. But before I ever use two different manufacturer rulers, I really do line them up. And I just look and make sure that all of my lines are lining up and that I cannot by my eye see any variation. And once I do that, then I feel pretty confident that it's okay for me to move back and forth between those two manufacturers or whatever other rulers I have that I have held up to just make sure. So I think that's an excellent, excellent point that you brought up and I'm so glad that you asked it. And I do think that it's worth looking at because I do have a couple of rulers that have come from other places and they are just a little bit different, just a tiny bit off from my Omnigrid or my Creative Grids ruler. So it's definitely worth doing that side to side comparison to make sure that your rulers are um, measuring the same. So good question. All right, and our next question here comes from Martina. Now you had mentioned uh, sewing with this, I believe you said scant quarter inch and Martina is asking, do we have to sew using a scant? Well, you do and that's a great question and let me explain to you why. So in fact, I have things right here to do exactly that. So you'll probably also notice that I, on the supply list, I suggested no flannels. And this will give you a really good reason why. When we sew our scant quarter inch, so here I've got two pieces of two rectangles that I've sewn together. They're the same size. I believe they were cut two inches. Yep, yeah, two inches and they are um, five and a half inches long. So I cut them two by five and a half and I 
stitched them together with my scant quarter inch. So they start would have started out right sides together like this. And then I would have set my seam and turned my piece of patchwork over and then pressed it again from the top. And when I put that piece of patchwork over, that's called the turn of the fabric. And so in that turn, that little fold of fabric that goes over the seam allowance, we have lost just a tiny bit of fabric, maybe one or two threads width, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you start having blocks with a lot of seams in them, one or two thread widths getting lost adds up to a significant amount of fabric. So in that turn of the fabric, what determines how much gets lost are two things the thickness of the thread that you've used in your seam and the thickness of the fabric that you've used because the thicker the fabric, the more that gets lost in the turn of the fabric. And let me show you a really good illustration of that. So here I took 12 pieces of nice, good quality quilters cotton. I cut them five inches, five and a half inches by um, two inches and sewed them together. No, one and a half inches because they're one inch finished. And I sewed all 12 of them together. And I used, because I'm, I'm kind of a math and science geek. And so I used, I tried to be as scientific as I could. And I used my patchwork foot with the guide on it so that I was sewing a consistent seam allowance amongst all my pieces. I had my little guide, okay? And I sewed them all together and I pressed all the seams in one direction and it turned out great. And then I cut the same size pieces from my flannel. So I used the same size thread and I always piece with a 60 weight thread. So it's pretty fine, but it's a three ply. So it's still strong. So I cut the same pieces from flannel. They're cut. Um, so they're one and a half inches by five and a half inches. And I pieced them together using the same foot. So I had a consistent seam allowance, but you can see that over the course of those 11 seams with my flannel patchwork, I lost a good half inch off of my pieced unit. And that's because my flannel is so much thicker than my regular quilter's cotton. So I lost more fabric every time my fabric turned over the seam allowance. Now it doesn't matter whether I press my seams to the side or whether I press my seams open, you're still gonna lose that, that same amount of fabric in that what we call the turn of the fabric. So that's why we can't sew just a, a, an actual quarter inch seam allowance. And the reason that we say scant and can't tell you exactly what that measurement is, is because it varies. Because in order for me to sew my flannels to be the, the size that I expect them, expect them to be, my seam allowance needs to be narrower or more scant than it needs to be for my regular quilter's cotton because my regular quilter's cotton fabric is thinner. And so there's no way to tell you from one fabric to the next how scant that quarter inch needs to be. It just needs to be scant enough so that the pieces that you end up with on the right side of your patchwork measure the size that you expect. So when I measure these, you can see they are an inch finished, which is exactly what they're supposed to be. But if I measure this, it's actually gonna be just a little bit less than an inch finished and, and it's because my fabric was thicker and that's why I lost more in the turn of the fabric. So that's an excellent question and I hope that that gave you um, a good explanation as to why to use a scant quarter inch. Now here is a check and balance that you can do and I really do recommend that people do this. This is the way to test your, your whatever seam allowance you're using with the fabric you're using. So if, if the fabrics for your table runner, for example, if you take some scraps of fabric and cut three rectangles, one and a half by three and a half inches and seam them together with what you think is the appropriate seam allowance and then press the seams to the outside. And what I do is I've got one of those little one inch wide Omnigrid rulers and my little Omnigrid ruler should now fit in there perfectly and it does it just snugs down right between those two seams if I put this ruler on here and my ruler extended beyond that seam line 
then that means that my seam allowance is too big and I need to make it more scant. If I put my ruler down and there was wiggle room, that would mean that my seam allowance that I used to sew this was too small and I maybe need to move my, my needle over so that I get a little bit bigger seam allowance. So I think this is just such a good test for whatever fabric you're working with. If I, if I um, went to sew on those flannels, for example, I would do this test and find out exactly where I needed to set my needle so that I would have the seam allowance that works for that thickness of fabric so that my patchwork ends up the size that I expect it to be, okay? All right, well, Kelly, we are at the end of our hour. So I wanna give you a very brief moment, if you can, in a minute or less, say your final thoughts on today's project before I finish up our live stream for today. Sure, why don't I come around to the front of the camera? Perfect. And, um, and then I can wave at everybody again. But really what I wanna say is, I, I think this is a really fun project from anywhere from a, a relatively, newbie quilter all the way up to people with a lot of experience because it's fast, it's fun, and you get a lot of variety in the blocks that you can make from it. So I hope that you'll give it a try. And it's been such a delight to be here with you this afternoon. I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I will look forward to seeing you hopefully on some more um, Craftsy and National Quilter Circle productions in the future. So I just take good care of everybody and, and thanks so much for being here. All right, and before I let you all go, I just want to remind you to join us again tomorrow for the Summer Crafting Party mini series. We will be streaming live tomorrow with our sewing instructor, Emily Steffen, and that's going to start at 2 p.m. Central Time. You'll be getting a live tutorial on how to make a bomb pop popsicle zipper pouch, and you can download the materials list and the free pattern right now using the link in the description before tomorrow's event. You can also find the entire mini series schedule in the video description so you know what to expect throughout the rest of the week. Until then, on behalf of the entire team, my name is Leah and we will see you tomorrow.